So now it's also my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Gita Nair. Our keynote speaker is going to share her perspective on pushing the boundaries of traditional rural healthcare. New technologies are changing our field in ways we could never have imagined, and also in ways, understandably, that can be both uncertain and overwhelming. Um, Dr. Gita Nair is a nationally recognized leader in health IT, a rheumatologist who bridges the divide between clinical medicine, digital health, and business. She's a best-selling author who appears regularly in the national media and is former chief medical officer at Salesforce. So please welcome Dr. Gita Nair to the stage. All right, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I always like to start the morning with a laugh, so humor me. Let me know you're awake, you gotta, gotta laugh. <laughs> and then I'd like to talk to you <clears throat> a little bit more about my personal connection with rural health. So this is me as a resident at George Washington University where I trained early 2000s. Won't tell you how old I am, but <clears throat> you get the picture. So I am the daughter of two immigrant physicians. I come from an Indian American family who was recruited to rural health at a time of a physician shortage in the 1970s. Mom is an internist, dad is an ICU critical care doc, 81 years old, still rounds to this day. And I was born in Beckley, West Virginia. This is the number one question I was ever, ever asked in every interview, Beckley? What, what's an Indian American doing from Beckley? So fast forward, <clears throat> fast forward to my training in the metropolis of Washington, D.C. I was on call as a newly minted rheumatologist, very excited to be a full-fledged doc. And I got a page, and I still remember this to this day. I got paged by the central operator at the hospital from a doctor in Nebraska. It was somewhere around two or three in the morning. This was a family medicine doc in Nebraska saying, hey, I have this patient. I can't get in touch with a rheumatologist. We don't have one. So I thought I'd call the hospital operator and see if you called me back. And I did, right? This is what you do when you're a young, naive doctor and you don't think about liability, <laughs> right? <clears throat> because all I was thinking about was the patient and he had a newborn patient with a very interesting rash. And his question was, was it lupus? Which has, for those of you who you know this, you can have heart block in a neonate. So I said, describe the rash. Is it flat? Is it macular? Is it erythematous? Right? So we did the best a family doc could do. I was not a rheumatologist. And then I said, gosh, what are the tools I have available to me to figure this out? Email. Right? We didn't have smartphones. I said, can you send me a picture? If you could just send me a picture, I think, you know, combined with the clinical story, I can help you out. So he emailed me a picture. Sure enough, I thought it looked like a lupus malarash. And I said, you got to get cardiology involved. Baby needs to be on telemetry, possibly needs a pacemaker. We saved that baby's life. But we saved that baby's life with email and a phone call. But the reason we were able to save that baby's life is because we put the patient first and we helped each other as colleagues. We knew what the right thing to do was. I won't talk about the world of hurt I had to face my attending in the morning to explain myself <laughs> as to how I exactly did this and how was I going to document and all that kind of fun stuff, right? But we are here today to talk about this. We are here today. Thankfully, we have more tools than email and a phone call when it comes to healthcare in rural America today. But what I want to impress on you is the most important part to your digital strategy, or any strategy for that matter, is going to be putting the patient first and doing the right thing with your colleagues in mind. 
where every technology strategy, every healthcare strategy fails, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, is when we forget those two things. What is the right thing for the patient? What would my colleagues do, and how do I do the right thing by the physicians, the care team, and the docs? And this is why we're here. We're here because we believe everyone should have access to a rheumatologist, not just the ones in the metropolis of DC. Right? Everyone should have access to the best care possible. And the AHA has invited us to have this discussion because we're at an inflection point in healthcare. And what I also want to impress on you is that what you do matters. I always say healthcare is the best industry to be in. We don't make garage openers. If somebody's garage doesn't open today, they're going to be OK. But what you guys do matters. What you do affects one in five Americans. 57 million Americans count on you for their health care. That is phenomenal. So never forget what you do matters. And this is the part where you're supposed to clap. So we're at a crossroads. I don't need to tell you this. We've all experienced it. We're living in a post-pandemic world, a world of TikTok, a world of every kind of technology you can imagine. Where do we start? Where do we start? Because the pressure is real. We continue to be asked to do more with less. Anyone CEO, anyone's bored breathing down their neck to make $5 stretch to 50, right? You're not the only one. It's happening all across healthcare. Misinformation. I'm going to talk first about the trends in healthcare and then how you can think about the solutions that are out there today to inform your future strategies. The first trend I want to talk about is misinformation. We are living in an era where people are thirsty for knowledge. One of the things that we took away from the pandemic is that health is truly wealth. And in healthcare, we haven't quite realized the effects of mis- and disinformation and how we inevitably, the end of the mis- and disinformation train is always a doctor meeting a patient in the emergency room. And we haven't quite come to a place where we understand our role in solving this. Does that resonate with all of you? And it's not new. Right? This was long before the pandemic. It started with the first vaccine. It started with the Black Plague. What's different is that because of the technology out there, because of the algorithms, because of social media, mis- and disinformation is traveling six times faster than the facts. And they are selling your patients supplements and vitamins instead of a colonoscopy and a mammogram. And this is dangerous. Too often in healthcare, we're so focused on putting out the fires that we don't have time to look and see who's starting the fire and what is its effect on our communities. It's trend number one. Trend number two, trust. We all talk about trust in healthcare, but we rarely understand how to scale it as an enterprise. And there is nothing more personal than your healthcare and who you go to to help you solve that as a family. What we have to understand about trust is that there's some good news and there's some bad news. The good news is 93% of Americans trust their doctor. 93%. It's a very, very high percentage. And it's actually higher in rural America. But 52% of Americans, more than half of Americans, don't trust the system. They don't trust the healthcare system that their doctor operates in, right? I want to believe that my patients love me so much. I'm Dr. G, and they love me, and I've known them forever. But you know what? In the era of consumerism, that's changing. That's changing because often the physician has little to do with the patient experience and the system. But the consumer doesn't know that. The consumer doesn't know that. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the threshold for changing doctors has changed. Next trend, burnout. How many doctors, how many nurses, how many care team members do we have in the room? This is very real. A lot has changed. The doctors and nurses of today are burdened 
They're stressed out. They're stressed out by bad technology. More paperwork than anyone can handle or that anyone went to medical school or nursing school to deal with. We have truly, truly taken away the joy of medicine. 50% of health workers reported that they often feel burned out. And these are the ones that reported, which means that it's higher. Nearly one in five healthcare workers have quit their jobs since 2020. And remember, we just talked about one in five Americans get their health care in rural health. So what does that mean? 333,942 health care providers have left the industry in 2021. That is an impossible physician shortage to make up for. It doesn't matter how much technology you have, the core and the gold in every one of your health systems is the doctors and nurses that raised their hands. We have to pay attention that the physician experience is tied to the patient experience. The nursing, the care team's experience is tied to the consumer experience. We often forget that in burnout. No one's having a great consumer experience if their staff is burned out and too busy looking at a clipboard to actually look anybody in the eyes. Does that resonate with the doctors and nurses that raised their hands? Great. So the other thing that has changed is consumerism. You know, this idea that you get to shop, you get to choose what you buy and why you buy it and when you buy it. Well, that's new for healthcare. We've talked about it for a long time, but today's consumer is demanding more. Again, they love their doctor, my patients love me. But guess what, they don't like my patient portal, they don't like the fact that the data never follows them, and frankly, I don't think they like our office manager. <laughs> so this is a top priority, right? 90% of healthcare provider executives say consumerism is a top priority. Why? because consumers have a choice for the first time. And they will switch, even though they trust their doctor. 69% of Americans would switch to a provider with more appealing services. That kind of hurts my feelings, right? But it's the truth. Because if you have to wait an hour and a half, two hours in my waiting room, you got stuff to do. So how do we as healthcare get better? How do we remember that, that the consumer experience matters? So consumerism, because of the age we're living in, has given rise to some, what I call the new kids on the block in healthcare. You guys like new kids on the block, you remember that, right? <laughs> it's pretty decent music. So who were some of the new entrants in healthcare because of this rise of consumerism? <clears throat> Retailers, big tech. You've seen them in your markets, right? CVS, Walgreens. Walmart says that 90% of Americans live within 10 miles of a Walmart. It's pretty significant. Pretty significant and much bigger of a footprint than any hospital can imagine, right? Big tech. Big tech was supposed to save healthcare. Anyone remember the Amazon, Berkshire, Hathaway, Haven project? What happened to that? Healthcare still hasn't been saved, right? Anyone remember Microsoft Health Vault? Launched, failed within three years. <clears throat> IBM Watson. IBM Watson was supposed to cure cancer. Didn't happen. The biggest gap with big retailers and big tech, they have tremendous pockets. They have tremendous, tremendous resources to throw at the problems we all know and understand. They have ample knowledge when it comes to consumer experience. But what they don't have is the knowledge you all have. They don't know healthcare and they don't know the communities that you serve. So while they are interesting allies and interesting competitors, one of the things I want you to think about is what is their role and how can you partner creatively? But to be clear, they will not save your communities. Only you are going to save your communities. Telemedicine. Look, for the first time, one of the biggest trends is that telemedicine has taken off. Again, been around a long time, just like AI, but for the first time, telemedicine has become 
a reality. And we have more options than email and a good old-fashioned phone call. Right? We've come a long way, and we should lean into that, particularly in rural communities where access remains an issue. AI. Has anyone heard of AI? <laughs> ChatGPT? This thing has gone viral. Again, technology is going to save healthcare. I don't think so. You are going to save healthcare. What technology can do, what AI can do, is incredible. It is incredible, and we are going to see many things change for the better. But we also might see some things change not for the good, not for the better. So the most important thing to remember about AI is that it will compound and be a force multiplier for both our good habits in healthcare and our bad habits, and our biases as we think about health equity and the rural communities that you serve. So we must, must, must be very intentional as AI goes mainstream. The state of rural health, that's why we're here. We're here so you can collaborate, talk to other leaders. You're here to learn. But the reality is that costs have gone up. You heard Dr. Conroy talk about this. The costs have gone up in rural America. Physician shortages are real. 10% of physicians practice in rural health, and they're leaving in droves. So we have to remember we continue to be asked to do more with less, and you take care of some of the sickest Americans. More comorbidities, more risk factors. So we're not set up in a great place for success, which just means you have to be savvier and smarter. Again, 10% of physicians work in rural areas, and this number is going down. 136 rural hospitals closed from 2010 to 2021, and I know a lot of you saw that and witnessed that and felt that. So what does it all mean? It means that we have sicker patients, we have less doctors, and we're, asked, we're being asked to do better. So one of the best things about technology is that it can drive efficiencies, and it can make your staff faster, smarter, and better, but it all comes down to how you implement. So what do you do? What do the leaders in this room do? Do you wait and watch, and watch as care is threatened and health equity and gaps continue to rise? Do you wait for big retailers and big tech, someone else, to come in and save rural health? I think you know the answer to that. Heck no, right? Heck no. The solutions are in front of you, and now we're going to focus on the solutions, and we're going to talk about digital transforma transformation, but digital transformation the right way. Because to date, we've thrown that around, and it doesn't necessarily leave a great taste in everyone's mouth, right? We particularly talked about this when we first started to roll out electronic health records. And we didn't do that exactly right. So we have to think about digital transformation in a different way. And there are a suite of tools to talk about, everything from AI to telemedicine to social media to online engagement. Number one, where do you focus? Telemedicine. Access is one of the biggest issues in rural health. Telemedicine can help alleviate that. You've seen that. You saw that during the pandemic, and you continue to see that today. Pre-pandemic, telemedicine really wasn't ubiquitous. It wasn't really a reality. Of course, it peaked and was accelerated during the pandemic for all the reasons everyone in this room understands. But here's where we are today. It's here, and it's here to stay. So we have to get smarter and better about it, because the telemedicine isn't just a video visit. It is a picture. It is a text message. It is a portal. How do you get smart about the strategies that improve access in your communities, make a rheumatologist available to everyone who needs one? And how do you figure out what those visits are and which is the right specialties to deploy these types of technologies? Saves money. Telemedicine not just saves money, it saves lives. Cutting 1% of emergency department visits with telemedicine could save $100 million per year. So many ER visits can be triaged. You know that. It takes a blood pressure check sometimes. It takes an antibiotic. The consumer doesn't know. So they go to the ER, and because they don't have access to a doctor, these are simple, simple things, but they make big, big impacts. The wearable revolution. OK. How many of you got one of these watches, one of the rings, something measuring your steps? Your heart rate, your mental status, your sleep, everyone has one. I know you're not raising your hands, but you got them, <laughs> right? 
The wearable market was about a $123 billion market in 2023. It is projected to be $351 billion by 2032. Again, the consumer is hungry for healthcare. They're hungry for access. They may not know what the steps mean. They may have no idea what the heart rate does, what the sleep does, but they want to measure it. It makes them feel empowered. So how do we as healthcare get smart? Apple is doing some interesting things. They're partnering with the NIH. They're partnering with Stanford. They're looking at heart studies. They've actually looked at whether the Apple Watch can save money on blood thinners for patients with AFib. That's pretty innovative. That's pretty innovative. So we will continue to see this market grow, and we will continue to see the consumer wanting to measure things, but then looking for the impact on their actual health and their actual bar bottom line, and doctors and hospitals that partner with them on their consumer data. Elevate online engagement. So I want to remind everyone in the room, because I know some of you are on your phone and you're looking at TikTok right now. <laughs> Right? 59 million Americans look to social media influencers for healthcare, misinformation, for healthcare information. And often, they're finding mis- and disinformation. What does that mean? That means that we've left this huge gap. Hospital doctors have left this huge gap. But the consumer's hungry, and they're thirsty for information. And they're finding people with amazing dance moves and music and they're inspiring them to do all kinds of things with their health. So why aren't we doing that? Why isn't healthcare doing that? We have to lean into that. We have to understand that everyone does businesses with brands that they know, they like, and they trust. I talk about this in my book, in chapter eight. There's a marketing guru that I followed, Bruce Turkle, and he says, look, the first step is they gotta know you. If you don't have a digital presence, if you don't have a social media presence as a hospital system, how do they know you? How would they find you? Because they're looking in these places, right? Secondly, they have to like you, right? They have to think that you have something in common with them, right? I'm a mom, the number one question when I drop off my doctor at, at, at the school is, hey, do you know a female OBGYN, do you know a female pediatrician? Do you happen to know someone who's Asian that sees Asian Americans? We have to understand that minorities prefer minorities. Women prefer women. We're people after all. So that like piece is really, really important. Making sure that we match up our minor minority communities with minority physicians and we tell that story and we say, hey, we're available to take care of you. And the last part of know, like, and trust is trust. And what is trust? Trust is you showing up for me every time I have a problem. But first, I have to know your phone number and you have to pick up the phone call. And then every time I need you, you show up for me the exact same way. Whether I have a chest pain, whether my child has a fever, that's what know, like, trust means in healthcare. The Cleveland Clinic has done this beautifully. Paul Matheson, Chief Marketing Officer of Cleveland Clinic, again, I talk about this in Chapter 8 at length, he intentionally said, you know what, I'm a marketing guy. I don't know medicine, I don't know science, but my doctors do. And Cleveland Clinic had a trust problem in their local community at the time. And he said, you know what, I'm going to go take a camera, make my doctors comb their hair, put on some lipstick, and I'm going to say, talk to me about colonoscopies. Talk to me about the three things every diabetic should know. And he took that information, which is every day what each one of your doctors does, and he scaled that at an enterprise level. He partnered with YouTube. He created a social media and digital pre presence for Cleveland Clinic that created that trust. But before we get to trust, he made sure his community knew them because they had a digital footprint. And then like them, he specifically made sure every community was represented, which they were at Cleveland Clinic in their providers. And then lastly, he said, you can trust us. And we're actually accountable for the information we put out there. So much so that you can make an appointment in person or virtually. How many of your hospitals are doing that? 
This is still novel, I understand that, but when you do this, you're able to drive not just your brand, but patient acquisition and retention. Lighten your load with AI. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the hype and reality of AI. So how many, have, how many of you have heard about robots taking the jobs of your doctors and nurses? We're not gonna need doctors and nurses any, any way they're burnt out, any way they're not coming to rural America. So let's invest in AI. How many of you think that that is a reality? Anytime soon. I think we all in the room understand that the fax machine is single-handedly being kept alive by the healthcare industry. <laughs> so we got a lot of innovation, but we got a lot of realities, right? We got, there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of reality when it comes to AI. The important thing to remember about AI is what we talked about in the beginning. When your doctors and nurses raise their hands, they are, they are burnt out, why? because of paperwork and bad technology. So focus your AI investments on that. Focus your AI investments on documentation. Focus them on not replacing the doctor or nurse, but augmenting clinical decision support. Prior auth, does anyone enjoy doing prior auth? Nobody enjoys doing prior auth. Stick AI on that, right? And as we think about drug discovery and the leaps and bounds we can make in drug discovery with AI, it's phenomenal, it's incredible. But this is the low-hanging fruit in AI. There is no consumer that knows, likes, or trusts an AI robot. So they are not gonna come to your hospital system to see an AI-enabled robot. But if their doctor, the one they know, they like, and they trust, Dr. G, for example, has that robot in the back, and it's a tool that makes me better, faster, why not? Just like a CT scanner, just like an MRI, just like a Da Vinci robot, it becomes another tool that your doctors can use to be better at what they do best, which is seeing patients. We know that AI could lead to savings in the billions. Up to 360, upwards of 360 billion is the current projections. Data, this is critical. When you look at solutions, so much of healthcare is about the data. And interoperability is one of the biggest mistakes that we have made in the industries. Listen, as a rheumatologist, I'll just give you a, a clinical example. As a rheumatologist, when patients are sent to me, I ask the natural question that any specialist would ask, just why are you here? Why did your primary care doctor refer you here? And they say, well, Dr. G, it's, I think they saw something on my blood work. And I say, okay, what was it? And then I say, did you, did, they see an, did you do an x-ray? Did they take a picture of your hands or your feet? And they say, well, you have a computer. Can't you look in your computer and see what my blood work and my x-ray was? And I, of course, smile because this is not the first time I've been asked this by a patient. And I say, no, that's a different hospital. We don't talk to each other. Of course I don't have your data. This is the first time I'm seeing you. So what do I do? I do the same thing that all your doctors do. I have to repeat that blood work. I have to repeat that x-ray. And what does that do? That delays the diagnosis, that delays the treatment. It's a bad experience for both me and the patient because that is an important slot that I just took away from someone else when I could have just gotten straight to, yeah, I think you have lupus or I think you have rheumatoid arthritis, but I didn't have the data. This is an area to invest in that will lead to tremendous, tremendous savings. Creative co-optition. So remember we talked about the big retailers and we talked about big tech. There's an opportunity here to partner. So while all of us in the room understand that going to a retailer is not the best care, it is not the best care for a, chronic, a patient with chronic disease, right? We know outcomes data tells us that the best health care is when we take care of a patient cradle to grave and they actually know us as doctors and we actually know them as patients. But that's simply not the reality that we're living in. When you just heard from Dr. Conroy that it takes upwards of six months sometimes to get a primary care appointment, depending where you are in the country. So there is a role for retail health and there is an opportunity to look at them. It's not just competition, but perhaps as a creative partnership for referrals, right? Because if some of your patients can get a simple blood pressure check, get their eyes checked, get their teeth checked, it's a pretty low acuity visit. 
understanding that the hospital is where the higher acuity patients will be and the procedures will be. There's an interesting startup in this space called Oshi Health. Have any of you heard of Oshi Health? So their focus is on GI specialty care in telemedicine. So what they're offering is GI specialists across the country, but they have very deliberately said, we want to work with hospitals to drive procedures, <clears throat> because obviously that can't be done virtually. But they're looking to close the gap in GI specialty care in partnership with hospitals. So things to think about, things to think about. Big tech. Big tech has realized <clears throat> that one of their failures is not understanding healthcare. So they are looking for partnerships. Cerner actually has an internship available for many of their customers. I learned this, I did a talk at University of Alabama. And they invited several of their clinical leaders to come and talk to them about their products, what works, what doesn't. Obviously, there are ample user groups by any one of these vendors. But there are more opportunities now in partnering with big tech than there were before because of some of the lessons learned. Clinical leadership. <clears throat> Clinical leadership is key, and I talked about it at the beginning. It doesn't matter which strategy you pick, which technology you decide to invest in, whether it's wearables, telemedicine, AI, et cetera. <clears throat> your clinical leaders know your patients best, and they know their colleagues best. They understand the workflow. They understand the pain points in everyday practice. Too much of healthcare technology and digital transformation today has been done to our doctors, <clears throat> to our nurses. This time, digital transformation has to be done with our doctors, with our nurses. How many of the doctors and nurses here welcome that? We want to be a part of the product roadmap, the vendor selection, the implementation, the decisions around strategy, because we know what will happen. We understand that you might solve one problem, but create five new ones. And then the staff gets really upset, right? And then they revolt, and they don't want to do anything with technology, which is where we're at today, largely because of the EHR. Is this happening at your hospitals? Does that resonate? Lastly, the answer. The answer is right here in this room. You all know healthcare better than anyone, and you know your communities better than anyone. The technology is there, and we will only continue to live in a health technology world. Technology is not going anywhere. AI is here to stay, and AI is here to change the game. So understanding that, making sure that you are aware of that, and the other piece we have to remember is the consumer is changing. I have a 12-year-old. She does not talk on the phone. They only text and they video chat when they absolutely have to, right? So the consumer of healthcare is changing, and it is a tech forward consumer. So as you make these investments, as you think about where your system needs to go, it's important to remember that. And it is important to remember that trust is everything in everything you do, and that it doesn't matter what technology you invest in. The consumer has to stay at the center, but your doctors and nurses are your biggest, biggest assets. All right, we're going in, we're going in for the close. So what's my call to action for this group? Number one, getting and staying infor informed about emerging technologies. Number one, being here, being a part of the AHA, coming together to stay smart, reading everything you can about this space, and talking to each other. I understand a lot of you may not have met before today, right? So taking the time on break, taking the time at lunch to ask, how have you solved this problem? Because often lots of your problems are similar. You face some of the same issues in rural health. Your biggest teachers are right here in this room. <clears throat> Number two, work with lawmakers to drive access to quality, including through telemedicine policies, AI, everything patient care. I heard earlier the reference to fantasy land. Washington, D.C. is fantasy land. They don't know what you know. I know it seems secondhand for all of us in the room, but they welcome healthcare leaders. They want to know, what is it really like? What is the reality? 
What do you think about AI? What do we have to be mindful of when we think about health equity? Lawmakers really welcome talking to patients, doctors, nurses, people who run hospitals like all of you. That input is tremendously important, particularly as we are at an inflection point with technologies like AI and social media. To this date, social media is largely, largely regulated solely by the social media companies. AI, we're still learning about it. And we're figuring out what are the ethical implications. What will this mean? You all know better than anyone. And you have to make sure that our lawmakers understand what they're doing with this new fire or new internet as it has been compared to. Invest. <clears throat> you have to invest. I know that the dollars are limited. I know that there is pressures to stretch your $5 to $50. But you must invest in the infrastructure and foundation that will meet the consumer of tomorrow. And it is largely a tech-forward consumer and a tech-forward doctor. The young doctors of today, man, they make me look bad every day in clinic. They have an app for everything. And they may not know the diagnosis, but they can get it like this, right? They can find it like this. So very important to understand that also for those of you that have academic medical centers, and as you think about medical education, this is really, really critical. This has to be part of your investment. Last but not least, keeping your head in the game, keeping the patient first. Big tech, big retailers, they are not here to save you. They are new to your ecosystem and they are absolutely not going anywhere. But you all know your communities best. And what we have learned to date is that is incredibly valuable. And when you put the patient at the center, when you partner with your colleagues and do the right thing, it doesn't matter if you only have email and an analog phone call. You can save a baby's life. And that's what this is all about. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm around later today. If there's any questions, I can answer. Thank you, Gita. That was really great. And I don't know about people in the room, but I'm getting my board kind of prepared that generative AI and the costs of that is probably going to be our next big investment across the health system. It holds so much potential to allow us to replace vacancies with technology, um, but we just have to understand how we can best harness that. Um, I want to thank all of you for helping us kick off the 37th AHA Rural Healthcare Leadership Conference. Immediately following this session, there is going to be refreshments out in the outside the ballroom, and then the concurrent educational sessions start at 10:15. Thank you, and have a wonderful morning. Thank you.